Okay, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. It's very soothing. She's very, very classy, very though, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should change the intro music. I know. Okay, give me a smile. <laughs> Thank you. Would you like a biscuit? Wonderful. <laughs> We're good to go? Technically, that's true. <laughs> We're good to go, yes. Let's do this. Oh, ring the bell, Alex. Oh, I love it. Welcome to the Troublesome Terps in London. Uh, we are delighted to have you here. It's like magical, isn't it? Normally we listen to you on a podcast and now you're here. You do exist. <laughs> you're, you know, fantastic. Uh, so we are delighted and... We are not by ourselves in a small room recording a program. Yes. Uh, in this room, there are uh, students on the MA conference interpreting. We've got graduates from a number, you graduated a number, a couple, of years, couple ago. of years ago. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we've also got uh, a former guest of yours, um, true, yeah. as Hugo is here. And I think that Hugo, maybe at the beginning of this initiative, actually, uh, when he had to do an exam uh, for the course, which, uh, which was a presentation. And in the presentation, he featured this special video, um, which uh, turned out into the 1NT <coughs> Hush campaign that went round and round. And uh, people <laughs> have been talking about it, have been using it. So what I love is that sometimes you may think that uh, an exam is a pain, but uh, an exam is also an opportunity to present something uh, to the interpreting world, to contribute to the interpreting world. Uh, and I think that today is the living proof of, of this. So I'm delighted to have a session with you all today. Uh, we've got quite a number of questions. I'm not sure how long you're here for, but you know, the questions. As long are, as you'll have us. <laughs> yeah, I know, you know, well, they, quite, they are there <laughs> for you. So um, I think I'll give you the floor back. And thank you again for coming all the way and being in the interpreting suite here with us at London Met. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having, Thanks us. For having us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I think it's quite ironic that uh, the one in T hush campaign actually went so viral that it brought us all the way to London. So that's <laughs> that's irony for you. But thank you very much for having us. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. And thank you to all of you for sending in so many such great questions. Um, there were quite a few when we got the lists, uh, but I think we are going to try our best to <laughs> run through all of them. Right. No. Yes, we should introduce ourselves. That's a really good idea. <laughs> so, normally it's three of us. Um, unfortunately, the third most troublesome turp of all <laughs> is currently en route to London. Yeah. Um, so, you're stuck with the two Alexes. Uh, so, I'm Alex number two. This is Alex number one. <laughs> um, I'm Alex Gansmeyer. I'm based in Munich, uh, working there, freelancing there, and my working languages are German and English. And I dabble in Italian on <laughs> on a leisure basis. <laughs> That's pretty much all I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, my name is Alexander Drexel. Um, I represent the the other side of the uh, interpreting market. I think in a way, um, I work for the European Commission in Brussels in the German booth. So I have German A, English B, and then French and Romanian C. So I hope that we can answer the questions from kind of both perspectives, I guess, so the freelancer and and the institutional market. Because my understanding is you also train for, uh, for the both, institutions basically. for yes, both, exactly. Mm -hmm. Which is not necessarily the case in Germany, I think, because the way the, ins I mean, the universities are set up in Germany is mostly for the private market. Yes. Yep. So you'd have A and B languages yep. mostly. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We do have A and B and the English A's tend to have A and two C's. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That All makes right. Sense. Well, that yeah, that works too. Yeah. 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 Okay. Right. Should so, we dive right in? Should we dive right in? Mm. Yeah. All right. Unless you guys have any questions before we get started, we would jump into the questions. 
All right. So the first question from Marina was, as interpreters, what was the most stressful situation that you have ever experienced and how did you overcome it? Um, Marina is right here in front of you. Oh, it's good to see you. Hi. <laughs> Marina, it's good to see you. Uh, yeah, it's a good question because I think especially when you're starting out, of course, there's going to be a ton of stressful situations. I'm sure you're experiencing a ton of stressful situations right here at university. Oh, yeah. Um, so we've put a, f a few comments uh, on the right-hand column so you can see it. I mean, there's a, a couple of breathing techniques. And, of course, you should also try to be as prepared as possible, especially when you're starting out. Um, but I think a lot of it has to do, especially in those first few jobs, uh, who you have the job with. So is it going to be a colleague that you already know? Maybe it's a former teacher or professor of yours. And that already makes you feel a lot safer. But I think especially in the beginning, it's all about preparation because it's a very unknown situation to be in that live, real life scenario interpreting. Um, so I think doing as much as possible that's in your control really kind of helps you kind of stay grounded in that situation. Would you agree? Yeah, I would agree too. And and I think that comment was for me. I, I was, yeah. because when you, you were probably asking about specific situations and I, I think the most stressful ones for me were the first jobs on the job or the first, the first meetings on the job. Um, and the funny thing is that the, the problem that I, or what, what I found most stressful, I think was, um, not knowing sort of how, how the meeting goes. So what, what the structure of the meeting is. So I did prepare, I think it was some, something about agriculture. So I did prepare all the agricultural stuff, but that wasn't the real, the real issue that the real problem was to understand how does a meeting work? You know, what, what's the role of this person and that person and how do they start? And, you know, and, and what, what the general sort of meeting jargon is, I think, which is quite specific for the European institution. So it may have been different for you. I, I, do you remember your first job, by the way? I do. I do remember my very first job. Yeah. <laughs> because I, I don't really, not really. You don't really remember. It's all the first a haze. Job. I, have, I, I, rem I remember the first couple of ones, sort of as a. No, I distinctly remember the first job, and it was actually with um, three booths, and it was German, Spanish, and French, and I was there with all lecturers from my school. So that really didn't help the, the stress. <laughs> oh <level>. God! <laughs> yeah, that really didn't help. But it was actually a really nice experience because everybody was very supportive, and obviously they knew that I was a student, so they kind of took extra good care of me, and they helped me in the preparation and. Um, It did go really well. Um, funny anecdote, actually, at the end of the job, the, the, the moderator of the entire event actually got all the interpreters out on stage, and then we got oh. a standing ovation <laughs> from the entire crowd. And I was nice. thinking, you know, it was my first job, so I was thinking, oh, this is kind of just how it goes normally. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, yeah, there was a, there was a rude awakening. <laughs> Take a bow, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh. Um, but it did help. In the end, it did help that it was with people that I knew. And of course, they kind of knew that I was the, the newbie. So they kind of showed me the ropes and made sure that, uh, you know, even in all the stress, uh, I, I knew how to operate the consoles and everything. But it was totally fine. And I think in the beginning, it added to the stress factor that it was all lecturers. But then in the end, I think it really helped. And um, of course, I was still nervous as heck. And after the conference, I distinctly remember going to a friend of mine because he was going to Colombia for a year mm. and you know I was so high on adrenaline that I was basically just skipping down the road and then as soon as I was sitting down on the bus I just completely crashed and fell asleep <laughs> so yeah um, but of course it's not only stressful situations in the beginning there's going to be stressful situations throughout your career so every time there's consecutive involved that's a very stressful situation for me um, but I find in those situations I mean it's just kind of like a band-aid like you just rip it off and get started and then as soon as you've got that for me it's always that first stretch kind of like the first yeah. shift that you do in consecutive and as soon as you realize hey it's kind of working out and everybody in the room is looking at you like how are they doing this, this is <laughs> magic and then you just kind of yeah. do like a little hair flip and you're like yeah well, i got this um and another stressful situation for me is always when it's about like television or like press conferences so when you know there's going to be like thousands and thousands of people listening to you I'm still working on that. Um, I think the trick is to not think about the thousands and thousands of people Except, yeah, listening exactly. to you. I think that's kind of what I do. And I think the tricky thing about working for TV is that you're not usually in a booth, but you're kind of in a, in a, in a mobile studio, yeah, in or, a studio or in some back room and you have a you have a screen of what the people see on television and then you have your mic set up and stuff. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's not 100% synchronous. So the lips are not synchronous to the video, which is ex extremely annoying, as you probably know already. So that, that doesn't exactly help. Yeah. Yeah. But I just want to get back to the breathing techniques for because it sounds a bit esoteric, but um, actually that there are quite a few exercises you, you can do. And maybe some of you are into, you know, yoga or meditation. So that's, that's if you're not, maybe that's a good, a good motivation to get a little bit into that. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, is, is anybody doing that? Or has anybody done first job already? That 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how did it go? Well, it went well. Okay. <laughs> as far That's as good. I can say. You're still here. That's great. Yeah, I'm yeah. still alive. <laughs> But um, I think breathing technique is very important to breathe very, you know, one, two, three, and one, two, three down. I think that mm. helps a lot. Mm. Yeah, I think because it's tricky sometimes when you when you get into the booth and there's this you know all around stress and, and buzz around sometimes it can be good to just go into the into a quiet corner and just calm yourself down and then you know i got this and, but actually yeah. there's a, a lot of colleagues who do that so one, one yeah. colleague in munich that i that i work with quite regularly he doesn't go into a quiet corner but he always puts in his own headphones and he starts listening to, B, to the bbc radio <laughs> for like at least 20 minutes yeah. and he does he, it's completely impossible to talk to him <laughs> in those 20 minutes yeah. um but he just kind of needs that like his own, own little private space yeah. if you will and then he gets in the zone and Then off you go. Yeah, I mean, you could even do like guided meditation or these. There are some apps or I guess audiobooks where they where they give you some instructions how to breathe. And it sounds, you know, kind of silly and esoteric, but I think it can really yeah. it can really help. In January, I have a, a former student who's organizing a one week course, mm. and it's about interpreting practice and yoga. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Uh, yeah. So it took place last year, and we are doing it again this year, and it created such a bond between people because they had to go through these relaxation exercises together as well, you know, and it opened um, it, it opened the way to lots of questioning and also to talk about how you feel when you, when you start and how you cope with stress because mm. you, you try to hide that sometimes because yeah. some people think that oh I'm not a, you know I'm not going to say that I'm I'm stressed yeah. you know I'm not going to come across as a professional otherwise but with the, with the course the interpreting practice really came together nicely because of the bond between uh, between students when they were also doing yoga every day yeah and I think some universities do it I think in in Galway for example there was one one colleague who you know just provides some information about mindfulness and that kind of thing and uh I, th I think it's important to bear in mind that we are all nervous at some point and that it's okay for you to be nervous and you don't have to hide it or anything. And if somebody gives you a hard time, it's probably just because they're, they're nervous, nervous, nervous too. too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it does get better. So, yeah, you know, it, it does. does get better. So the first few jobs are going to be intense, but then you just kind of have your own routine. There are still mm. topics that are going to make you nervous. So anytime I do something yeah. legal, which I try to avoid, I, I basically are wrecked for two weeks before the job, uh, which is why I try to avoid these jobs. Um, But yeah, there's always going to be something that's going to make you nervous, but it's going to get a lot easier as, as you progress. Yeah. yeah. And just, that of course. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. I just have a wireless mic, probably. There we go. Because <laughs> I popped my cherry just about a year ago. And, um, and uh, I remember I did, I did something that perhaps I shouldn't have done, which is uh, I looked up who my booth partner was going to be since she wasn't answering my emails. And it turns out she was a former UN interpreter. Yeah. So, and I could actually see her CV there online. And you could see that she had interpreted for Hillary Clinton, Kofi Annan. And I was like, okay, so uh, this is the standard. <laughs> so I was, that added to the stress. Yeah. But the truth is, the minute you get going, that goes out of the window. Yeah. You know, it's all about what you have. And if you have confidence in yourself and you, you know you can do a good job, eventually she was she came to me and she was like, your English is very good. You know, I was like, oh, yes, result. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I think once, once you get going, if you have it and you have it because you're here, yeah. it, it, it will work and you will make it work. And there's this, this stupid... Um, sort of mind hack for public speaker uh, for public speakers is that you should imagine your audience naked to you know get over the stress and the nervousness. So I, I'm not suggesting you do that, but you know if, if you work with people who have this impressive CV, you can just imagine them being on their first job ever, mm -hmm. and they were probably in exactly the same state that you're in. So absolutely, you know. yeah. But I also think there's this whole notion of positive stress. So you know, like with with actors or, or stage performers or singers. There's kind of that, that adage that says, like, as soon as you're not nervous anymore before the performance, it's probably time to find a different job. And I think it's kind of the same for us, because I think if you just sit there and you're completely and you're just like, yeah, whatever, I'm just going to do this, then huh. I'm not sure if you're fully in it. Maybe. Well, you're we should. This kick, right? You're not getting yeah. the adrenaline, you're not getting the kick. Yeah, yeah. and That's I think you job. kind of need a little bit of that at least to kind of kick started. Yeah. So if you're really bored by interpreting, you should probably... Try translation or something. I don't know. Oh. I don't know. That's a controversial <laughs> statement, right? There. Yeah, that might be controversial. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But I think it kind of dovetails nicely with the uh, next question, right? Yeah, so this was basically about starting starting out as a graduate, right? Mm. Um, and I think s since we're both quite active members of a professional association, yeah. the first thing that kind of came to mind for us was, well, you should obviously join a professional association. Um, and... Um, 
I think there are several reasons for that. And, and I think that the first thing to say is that um, often people say, yeah, what, why, sh why should I bother? What's, what's the point? And also it's, it's expensive. And that's true. Um, but some of the, some of the professional associations actually have sort of lower fees for students or recent graduates. So if you're not a fully fledged interpreter yet, um, you'll, you'll pay a reduced fee. I think even, right. even in AIC and you don't have to prove any, you know, usually all you have to show is kind of your diploma, I guess, or your certificate. Yeah. Um, and for me, the most, I've, I've, I was always a member of a professional association already back in when I was still at university. And the good thing was really that you get to know people. Um, so you get to know people from your local group. If, if it's sort of a national association, but they usually have local groups or meetups or things Absolutely. like that. So that's a great way to to break into the network of people and, yeah. and to make your first contacts. And I have it on very good authority that London Met has actually just been approved for the VKD. So this is the German uh, Association of Conference Interpreters. They've just been approved uh, as one of the uh, accredited institutes. So the German Association, just in case anybody here plans on working in Germany or with German, uh, for those that, for the VKD, it works just the same. You basically just show them the diploma because you're now at London Met, which is accredited. So that's all you need to do in order to kick things off. And there are mentoring, uh, the mentoring yeah, schemes. Yeah, to... There's, of course, roundtables. Yeah, there's all these meetups. So I think that's a really, really good way. Um, and also, don't be hesitant to volunteer for the associations because that's kind of how I started off a lot, uh, doing a lot in the kind of interpreting community. Just because I was figuring in the beginning, I don't have a lot to contribute, but I have a lot of time. So with a lot of time, I can kind of help other people who have a lot to contribute. And um, so that's kind of what I did. I started off in Manchester, organizing a few events here and there, helping other people who had something to say, actually make sure that they had the right... Um, sort of environment to do so this that. this was for ITI, right? This was for the NWTN, oh, Northwest know. Translators Network. And then I went to the ITI, and then I went to the German Association of Conference Interpreters, and I've just kind of, I guess I always was kind of lucky. I always was at the right place at the right time, <laughs> yeah. or maybe the wrong place at the wrong time. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, depending on how you look at it, because I always ended up being part of like the management boards or the boards of these various associations just because nobody else wanted to do it. And I said, sure, I have time. I, <laughs> I have no idea what I'm supposed to do, but I can do it. Yeah. And yeah, and then it just kind of snowballed from there. And I, I but think the thing is, was, you know, if you do it well, you can yeah. really, you can really make a name for yourself exactly. and, and get great contacts. Exactly. Yeah. And most of these people are really nice. I mean, it seems very daunting if you contact like the Institute of Translation and Interpreting, but they're all just people, and they know that you just came from university, and they're all going to help you. They're not just going to throw you in the deep end, and you know, it's not going to be sink or swim. They're yeah. going to be. Well, and they're you. actually happy to have you know recent exactly. graduates, new people. Um, exactly. To, yeah. yeah. Keep keep the association going. Absolutely. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> much easier than being at home by yourself yeah. or trying to figure out how you're going to start because yeah. uh, as my mom would say it's not going to happen in your kitchen uh, absolutely uh, so if you don't go out uh, and if you don't um, come out of your shell um, yeah. it may be a bit daunting but far less daunting than waking up in the morning and trying to figure out how am I going to make it today how am I going to earn some money you know, exactly. or make a name for myself so I definitely uh, yeah. concur yeah. with you mm -hmm. I think also a good way um, is because you're obviously all going to be doing your master's thesis. And if you have a, a topic which you believe could it be interesting to the wider interpreting community, you can also offer sort of other journals or like the linguist. You could offer to write an article based on your thesis because you've already done half the work. So you can kind of use it for a little bit of publicity and share the knowledge that you've been able to gather throughout your work. So that's kind of an, an easy first step. To yeah. And have. they're actually happy to have, you know, material from a wide variety of, of yeah. people or sources. They're always looking for content. Yeah, <laughs> because it's not easy, you know, getting a magazine exactly. out every month or so. Or even if you go to an event, you yeah. may want to write about the event exactly. that you attended yeah. and share your feelings or what you learned with others. Mm -hmm. We did yeah. that last year. That was very good. Yeah, and then people who can't attend, they're happy to get a... Um, like a feedback, some uh, yeah. thing. Yeah, some absolutely. information, exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh, the thing that I wouldn't recommend, though, is just kind of because a lot of people are saying, well, of course, social media nowadays is very important, but don't just rely on that. I think it's kind of part of the mix, but you're not going to get a blooming career just because you're tweeting or Facebooking all the time. Like, that's could, not going to happen. Be the opposite. <laughs> it could actually be the opposite. I think it's good if it's kind of like in the mix, because especially on Twitter, obviously, it's easier to get a, a hold of people that you would normally not really get in contact yeah. with. Um, but that's not going to make you rich or the most famous interpreter, most renowned interpreter around the world. But it's it's good to keep an eye on it, but don't put too much emphasis on it, I would mm. say. Right? Yeah, it's more of a networking kind of thing. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, which actually dovetails nicely into the next question. <laughs> yeah. Again, uh, 
uh, and it's about the different technologies that assist in translation and interpreting, and they've been upgraded and researched more recently. And how would they change the interpreting process? Uh, and how do we envision the merge of technology and the profession in the near future? Um, that's a very multi-layered question. Uh, do you want to take that, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Tab Turf? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was actually just just starting with a bit of structure because it, it is a, a big question. It's a good question, but it, it's it's quite big. Um, and I, you, you actually, you may have used this article before. There's a, an article from Barry Olson, who um, teaches interpreting for the Middlebury Institute of Interpreting Studies, and um, who's also very tuned into technology. Um, and Barry had a great article a couple of years ago, which is called "Interpreting and the T Word." Um, and he was basically, he, he basically gave a structure of how, because, you know, people of, often wonder, yeah, what, what's this whole technology deal about interpreting? So anyway, he has three categories in the article and it's really worth a read. So the first one would be technologies that enable interpreting. So we're talking about, you know, microphones and the whole conference technology set up. And, um, you could even include pen and paper for consecutive if you wanted to. So everything that, basically allows us to do our job as interpreters. Um, the second category is technologies that assist interpreters. Um, so we would be talking about, I don't know, maybe, you know, terminology solutions, um, glossary apps, glossary maybe apps. just, just um, laptops and tablets in general as research tools that you use for preparation, but also in the booth, maybe all these, these kinds of things. And the third category is, is probably the most interesting one. And maybe what the question was getting at uh, is technologies that could potentially replace interpreters. So we're talking about machine interpreting, um, all these translation apps and translation earbuds, <laughs> and it's kind of a running gag on the show though. Um, but um, I think that's kind of a useful structure to to start with the whole thing. And when it comes to technology that enables interpreting, we've always used technologies um, as interpreters. I mean, you could probably exclude shishotage, you know, whispered interpreting that works without technology. But um, as soon as you talk about simultaneous, where you need booths and microphones and all, all that um, stuff, then of course there there is no simultaneous interpreting without technology. Um, but uh, when it comes to assisting um, interpreters, there there have been a lot of developments. So we we got these nice you know tablets and smartphones, and you probably all use them for your um, studies as well, maybe to record yourself when you when you interpret, so you can listen back and. Um, that kind of thing. And when it comes to the technology that replaces, um, there's, especially right now, there's a lot of marketing buzz out there, a lot of hype and, you know, startups saying that we finally cracked the translation problem or the, mm -hmm. the language, we finally broke down the language barrier and that kind of thing, which is an interesting framing because I don't really see it as a barrier, but that's, that's another question. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, I think it's helpful to, to, kind of filter out all the marketing bus and to look at what these products actually do. So if you have like the Google Translate app for your smartphone, for example, which you've probably all tested to some extent. So it's it's fine for looking up something quickly or maybe um, asking for directions to the hotel or to mm -hmm. the train station or whatever. Um, and, and those are all situations where you would, where you wouldn't have used an interpreter anyway, because you, you don't have one right now when, when you're traveling. Um, so it's not really taking away work. Um, and even even though there are all these claims, I, I really don't think we are there yet. We may be one day, who knows? But um, I think even when they've sort of presumably cracked the translation problem, there will still be, I think, a lot of space for a human interpreter. Um, but yeah, that's that's probably that's probably a big a big topic. I don't know if we want to get into that. Um, and maybe just a word on on remote. Um, as far as I can tell, you're quite tuned in here with new technologies and and video conferencing. I think remote will be um, a, a very. It, I think it already is probably, but it's it's probably going to be um, a much bigger piece of the pie. And I think the interesting question for remote is how much interpreting will it replace, and how much new, how many new opportunities for uh, interpreting will it create? Mm. Because you have meetings nowadays where people just don't even think about bringing in interpreting, and they're so oh, we'll just do it in English. Um, and then if you give them the tools, like an online platform, for example, it can mean that they will finally think about bringing in professional interpreters because they now have this this tool or the technology available so that that can be a good thing 
But if I can just jump in there real quick, because I think we have to qualify that we're talking about remote interpreting and conference interpreting at the moment, because there's obviously already a ton of remote interpreting out there when it comes yeah. to public service interpreting, medical mm -hmm. interpreting, legal interpreting. So that already happens, and that's totally fine, and that works for what it's supposed to do. But I think the, the whole new big shift, the par that paradigm shift that everybody's talking about is co remote interpreting in conference interpreting, which is what you were talking about, mm -hmm. I think, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's a helpful. And I could add another dimension, which is the, the remote teaching of uh, yeah. interpreting as well. Mm. Uh, I've just put a, a, a new bid for a case study for second interpreting suite, and it's all geared towards mm -hmm. you know remote oh, wow. teaching of uh, interpreting yeah. and also remote interpreting. So that mm. is the rationale behind you know the, the second interpreting uh, room that we're we're asking for, mm. uh, because I really think that nowadays uh, more and more people are finding it difficult to travel, to get visas, uh, to get uh, a year off work, uh, mm. and you need some flexibility Flexibility in the access to teaching and learning, yeah. and especially mm. for in the world of interpreting, it's mainly face to face. And I think that you know there is a, a new future ahead of us uh, with remote teaching and learning uh, for for interpreting. Mm. Yeah, and, and and many colleagues are already doing it. I mean, you're doing mm -hmm. it. Um, that's Glendon, um, mm -hmm. so the, the masters in. Canada, I'm not That's sure right, which city Canada, it's yes. in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Toronto. Uh, York University. Toronto, Toronto exactly. So they, it's a two-year course, and the first year is entirely online. Mm -hmm. So people can join in from around the world, basically, and then but then they still have to go there for the second year. But um, I, th I think it's a good way to get started. And Barry as well, he teaches mm -hmm. many of his classes remotely because mm -hmm. he's based on the East Coast, and the Middlebury Institute is in California. So he does a fair bit of remote teaching as well, which probably um, also helps the development towards more remote because people are just more used to it yeah. whereas in our old generation you know <laughs> it's just, just that that years to technology that's um, old timers yeah. right but that actually brings us nicely into the follow-up question uh, that andre mentioned because yeah, he's yeah. asking do you see the possibility for us to speak to that a little bit only work from yeah. yeah to only work from home or the office through video conference in the future and why um well the question is why would we want to right i think the possibility might exist in the future because there's already a ton of online platforms out there that would be more than happy to you know pay you by the second pay you by the minute or pay you by the hour or half hour depending on on where you sign up for you to do those things but um personally i think part of the joy of interpreting is kind of working with people you know going out there going to the events meeting the client meeting your colleague uh, so that's part of the reason why i enjoy this job so much so i think while the possibility already partially exists. I don't think we need to wait for the future for, for video conferencing in that way. Um, I personally don't see the incentive for me to go down that route. Um, and this is, of course, assuming that all of the, 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 the working conditions are ideal so that the video is good, that the sound is crisp, that there's no big delay, that the connection works, that you have the right online platform that you can operate properly even when you're interpreting. Um, I don't know if we are fully there yet. I wouldn't be fully confident in saying, yeah, we can totally do that. And it's always going to work 100% of the time. Um, but when does technology ever work 100% of the time? Um, There's a, a lot to unpack there, actually, because um, yeah. I think it's similar for Jonathan. I think he at some point decided that for now he's he's not doing remote because he really... He wants to provide this sort of personalized yes. service for his clients. and and But that's what I think to a large degree it comes down to your personal decision and what you feel comfortable with. Yeah. Then there's the whole thing of, yeah, I think even liability. So you have to make sure that your equipment at home is up to snuff. So you have the right technology, that you have a good, decent internet connection. Um, and that's all on you then yeah. usually. Um, but if that's okay for you, um, I think that that's fine if you're willing to make that investment. And when it comes to the platform, I think I would choose a platform that doesn't get in the way, that only provides the technology. Mm. Because as soon as you have a platform that also tries to be an agency and kind of push <laughs> push down prices, I think that's not that's usually a bad sign. Yeah, that's usually a really bad sign. Then you have kind of the, the cheap the cheapsters. But oftentimes even clients don't really realize what goes into the whole um, remote interpreting from home. Can you just do this this meeting real quick? Because I actually had an, an inquiry last year, I think it was, or two years ago. And I explained to them, well, you know, what if my power goes out? What if the mailman rings and all of a sudden all you hear is like my doorbell ringing? What if the neighbor's baby starts crying and you have a crying baby in the background of, of your conference stream? And I explained this to them. And then I actually, as you were mentioning, mentioned the liability. Mm -hmm. I put it all down in my quote, in my contract. And then they were like, well, you know, actually, um, why don't you just come in. I think that's going to make it easier. So I was like, yeah, yeah I think I, I agree. I think it's going to make it a lot easier. It works for me. 
Um, cause oftentimes they just think, oh, we're just going to Skype you in. That's fine. Yeah. But that's not how it works. So they, they literally wanted me to log on to two online platforms from, from my laptop, one in order to hear the sound and then one in order to provide the sound. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I had to in explain to them in the first place that then I couldn't switch languages. So it would literally only be monodirectional. And then they were saying, well, we kind of need you to go both into German and into English. And I said, well, that's not going to work. Yeah. So that was the first problem. And then I also said, well, you know, my laptop uh, doesn't actually have, like, it only has Wi-Fi. Like, you literally can't connect the LAN cable anymore. So that's another issue. And then what if the power goes out? What if this happens? What if that happens? Um, I wouldn't have charged them extra for any studio time just because the whole idea was I can do it from my from my home office. Yeah. Um, but I did include a surcharge because the working conditions were harder. So I said, well, obviously, um, since it's all on me, since I have to prepare all this stuff, and since the liability would be on me, there's obviously going to be a surcharge for that. Uh, but then they didn't go for it anyways for a variety of reasons, which uh, I didn't mind. Yeah. At all. But I think that that shows that you as an interpreter, you kind of have to know what's out there. What are the solutions that that exist? Um, what are the, that what what can it do? What can it what can't it do? Well, um, so it's it doesn't mean that you have to sort of influence your client and tell them, well, remote is actually bad. I'd, I'd rather come to your place. But you should, you know, lay out the pros and cons and then the client can take an informed decision on whether they want remote or whether they actually want to have you there on the spot. Hmm. I think that's what it boils down to, I guess. Yeah. And as I agree. When, when you've got this, when you've got the experience of working with an online platform, share your experience with others. Mm -hmm. So we've got a, um, a graduate who had a first experience with a remote platform, mm -hmm. and she wrote a full text um, to all of us about the tips that you should bear in mind, or the pieces of advice that you know would be useful if you had such an assignment on using this platform. So I think that that's quite um, that's quite interesting as well Absolutely. to share your experience with with other colleagues. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And again, you can totally write an article for the yes. linguist or something <laughs> yeah. on, right. based on those things. Um, yeah, but just generally talk to each other because I'm sure like, especially in this generation of interpreters coming up, this is going to be more of a topic going forward. So I think if you guys have made that experience, if you can say, hey, this actually worked really well or don't try this, it did not work at all. Just share it with the others and kind of help them out in that way. Um, but what I keep saying is not everything is for everybody. So while you might feel like remote interpreting from home is the bee's knees, you might not like it at all. And that's totally fine. I mean, give it a shot if you're up for it, but don't feel like everybody's doing it. I have to do it because not everything is for everybody. Mm. You do you. <laughs> you do you. <laughs> you do you, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I think we're good to go to the next question, yeah, right? I think so. Uh, this is by Veronica. Veronica. And she's sitting right opposite. Ah. Ah. So I'm going to give her the mic, maybe. You want to ask your question? Yeah, do you want to ask your question? Wrangling the mic. Watch out with your venti yes. there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, the question is about advanced preparation. So um, basically, I wanted to know if you have like specific tips related to advanced preparation when we don't get any materials beforehand, because it can be very frustrating. And sometimes, especially me, I feel I don't even know if I'm focusing on the right thing mm. or mm. I'm completely wrong and I should be focusing on something different. Right. Um, we had a quick talk with Danielle before we started talking to you because we were wondering how open and honest we should be with you guys. Um, I'm afraid that's something that you're going to have to get used to because <laughs> that's really just part of part of the whole interpreting deal, especially nowadays. It used to be different. I hear from more experienced colleagues that it used to be quite different. But oftentimes you're lucky if you get the agenda. Oftentimes you literally, the day before you're like, um, tomorrow's the meeting. I still don't know when it starts. I still don't know what time it ends. Like what's, what's going on. So oftentimes you're going to be finding that, uh, you're really struggling for that preparation material. So depending on what you do, depending on whether you've done that type of meeting before, which eventually you'll, you will have covered a ton of different meetings. It's going to be easier because as Alex mentioned, you'll know the structure of the meeting. You kind of know exactly what to expect. Um, and other times you just kind of, they will hopefully tell you sort of what we're doing. Like, is it going to be a, a works council meeting, a supervisory board, a press conference? And then you can kind of probe in that direction. Cause especially if it's a press conference, it's usually because the company has something to announce, which they would have to tell you 
I, I don't think that's ever happened oh, to me. Yeah. yeah, that's never happened to me. A press conference where I didn't know what was what was being announced. That would be terrible. That would be, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that would be quite. Uh, yeah. Knock on wood. <laughs> yeah, but it, I, I think there's again there's several aspects to it. So, so first of all, I think it's important to explain to the client why you need yeah. stuff in advance because some people think, well, you know, you've studied languages, you know all the words. Why do you need? background information and then you have to point out to the client why that is and that you know the better you perform the better it makes them look um to for especially when it's like a public event like a yes. press conference or a you know whatever like a, a marketing event for example um so that's one thing and then secondly if if then still you don't really get anything then you still have you know you still have a few hooks that you can use for example so you'll know who the client is so you can do some research into the client is it a company is it a non-profit yeah. is it you know a whatever and then you, you can do some research there so that at least you know what the company is about what they're doing what what the event could be about if they're not willing to tell you for some reason although that is kind of strange though but it happens yeah it happens sometimes yeah but and I if you have um, especially if you have names to go with so maybe you have a few names of people who will speak at the event um, you can google them um, what a lot of people do nowadays uh, I think if if it's a person that is a bit more well known maybe an author you go to YouTube and then you can check out how how are they like as a public speaker are they a, a fast talker maybe a slow talk and then you can sort of plan for that and get a few strategies ready so that's that's kind of useful and oftentimes especially for bigger speakers like especially keynote speakers if you go on youtube you will actually find that they kind of recycle their speeches <laughs> or at least parts of their speeches they have so, their usual shtick, yeah, yeah they have their usual exactly. stick so you actually watch the thing and then you go onto the actual conference and you realize oh i've actually done like this 10 minute stretch that was in the youtube video so that really helps and um i think you just have to be proactive because oftentimes the clients are so you Unfortunately, interpreting or interpreters are usually quite far down the food chain when it comes to the event. And especially the bigger the event is, the more, let's say, forgetful the client becomes when it comes to, to kind of what we need in order to perform. So just be a little bit proactive. Usually. So you're I'd, just below, just below the flowers and the catering. Usually. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is good if the, if the catering actually gets a lot of attention. That also <laughs> yeah. benefits the interpreter. So exactly. that's, that's not too bad. But I don't think I've been to an event in the last two or three years that wasn't like a private uh, confidential meeting that didn't have an event website. So then you just go on the website and there you usually can find the agenda and then you can find the name list. So even if the client doesn't send you all that stuff, just go on the website. You can find those things. And I had one other well, thing which I forgot. Maybe they have a hashtag going already. You know, they can dive, <laughs> dive into the hashtag and see what it's about. That's right. Yeah, yeah but I think it's just... Um, I forgot what I was going to say. I had something really good. I don't know. Uh, Wikipedia is your friend, something like that? Probably. <laughs> yeah. So, for example, if, if you know what the company, for example, is about or, you, or your client, then um, you can do, do at least some basic level research on Wikipedia and you know, what, what field are they working in, what what are the basics and what are maybe the recent developments in this field. So, at least you, you, you'll always have something to to work with, I yeah. think. So while while I get that it's frustrating, I think there's it's not it's never been the case for me that I had really absolutely nothing to to go by. But agreed, sometimes really? sometimes you've been to an event where you had no idea what's coming up. Well, okay, the no, who, no, the no what? So, right. So nothing. Yeah. So usually, you at least get the agenda somehow, somewhere. Yeah. You usually get the agenda. But you know but who I, you're working for, unless you have an agency. You do know who you're working quickly, for. Yeah. But oftentimes, so sometimes I find that really doesn't help, especially when you're dealing with very, very um, complex conferences. So I had a conference on renewable energies and like geothermal energy production. I do that once a year and we get the agenda and we get the um, conference, sort of like the abstract collection, which is like a PDF with like 500 pages. So that doesn't really do you much good either. Um and then you regularly have a, a German or Bavarian official coming in. And last year, or this year, actually, they opened the conference by reading out two pages of the Bavarian mining laws. Oh, my God. Like, there's nothing you can do to that. You couldn't even, I mean, you, I guess you could probably, like, take the entire law, translate it just in case. And then, like, as he starts reading, you could go through the thing and then read it off yourself. But... Mm. there's there's <laughs> just nothing you can do and so in those instances it is a bit discouraging but you just kind of um what was it is it the swan it's elegant on the surface and then kind of like yeah, paddling paddling, underneath. Yeah. <laughs> so just don't let them see you sweat in those kind of instances you just kind of paraphrase it and you say oh so according to the german mining law or bavarian mining law like this is a roughly what it says and and then you just kind of figure that out but that happens to me a ton 
that I don't get the any preparation. <laughs> the mining law. That happens once a year. Yeah. Always pleasant. <laughs> but um, <laughs> You're already looking forward to next year. I know. <laughs> but yeah, so it happens to me a ton that you get the agenda, but then no uh, preparation material. And oftentimes it's actually not the client's fault because the speakers literally don't give them anything. That's happened a lot as well, that we actually spoke to the conference organizers. Oh, that's what I wanted to say. Right. Uh, that was another anecdote. So that, ding, that ding. just happened. <laughs> ding, ding. That just happened recently where we were um, hounding the conference organizer because it was about some like insurance topic, again, very technical. And she was saying, no, 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 it's going to be like a, a free speech, an impulse speech. He's not going to have any presentation. And then the guy came on stage with his laptop and he said, somebody plug this in. I have a presentation. And then he started reading like insurance policies. So she really tried. She really didn't know because then everybody was kind of hustling and bustling to get his presentation on screen. So sometimes it's not their fault and they're suffering with you. So cut them some slack, but... Um, <laughs> not too much. <laughs> not too much, because we need to do our job as well. <laughs> yeah. But um, don't be discouraged. It's we're, we're doing our best with what we have. And then if you get the preparation material, obviously uh, prepare as much as possible. And while we're at it, sometimes it's actually easier for us to not get the preparation material. And this might be controversial. Mm, uh, <laughs> but um, I'm sure this has happened to you as well, that like, at 10 p.m. before the meeting, like the mm -hmm. night before the meeting, you get like an info dump of like 35 documents, 20 presentations and like 17 word documents. And then it's like, well, great. I have like five hours to go. Thanks. No sleep. So in those yeah. instances, it's actually, I feel like it's easier to not get anything because then it helps me at least get a good night's sleep. I think that is actually controversial <laughs> yeah, well. because it's true. You Sometimes you get that they just, you know, if you've been so successful in convincing your client that you need material to prepare with, they just dump, you know, 50 files on you. Um, but still, you'd, you'd still, I think ideally you'd still take a look. I don't. Well, you'd, <laughs> you'd, you'd no, still try to figure out, you, okay, is there an agenda in there? Are there some, right. are there some PowerPoints that I'll just quickly go through at least to, to see? Because then at least it helps you spot any potential unpleasant surprises. So I, I, I don't think I just ignore all the files. At least I'd have a quick, no, so quick the go through. The, the point that I'm trying to make is not the information dump per se, because that's obviously great, because the more you have to work with, the better. But the, the information dump the night before, that's the part where I just go, okay. This you, is you should not strive to go through everything and then right. not sleep at exactly. all. Exactly. Not so, good, but yeah. the agenda, I actually think like the agenda is an interpreter's best friend. It is. That's, uh, yeah. And that's your takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> it's our best friend. <laughs> oh yeah. my goodness. Is, right, um, uh, is Annie here? Yeah. Oh, hi Annie. Nice to hi, meet you. Hi Annie, nice to meet you. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, instead of looking forward, uh, I hope to we take a look at uh, back at the days when you were the training uh, training interpreters. Uh, among all the things, the knowledges and the techniques and the instruction from the professors, what do you think are the ones that help you and influence you most even to this day? And the second question is that um, if there is another chance or a second chance, uh, are there anything you hope to do differently or in another way in university? So mm. that's it. Thank you. It's a great question, actually. Um, I, I kind of, um, kind of jokingly said last night to Alex that the w one thing that I really remember almost in every job, or every consecutive job, is my my French interpreting teacher because she was very, very specific about how we take our notes, what the notepad should look like, which kind of pen we should use, mm. and, like, and that still kind of haunts me to this day. But um, I still remember. I it gave me a lot of it kind of reassured me because I knew exactly what I was supposed to do. And then of course I still had to get the notes right, you know, and work on my symbols and that kind of thing. But at least, you know, I had something to, to work with. Um, and, and, and that still helps me because I still do quite a bit of, of consec, um, even nowadays. Um, but I think what I, what I remember most fondly, I guess, um, would, um, would be that as I, as I wrote here, the camaraderie with, um, with my other students, that was really the, I think the best thing about being at, at university because we, we did spend quite a bit of time in, in the lab, in the interpreting lab, but we also spent uh, a lot of time just in practice groups. Mm. So we would give each other speeches, um, because the speech repository and that kind of thing wasn't that wasn't a thing back then. That's, a, <laughs> that's how old I am. So we still had to actually give speeches to each other um, and also critique each other and, and give feedback. And that was actually, 
That was good because sometimes it could be quite tough, the feedback you would get, mm. but it wasn't personal. Um, and that was great because it was really meant to, to help you and to, to help you advance. Uh, that was, that was really good. I don't know if you, did you do the same? At we university? did the same. Yeah. Has the feedback episode already been published? No, no. It's coming so we're soon, actually, right? we're actually <laughs> talking about like feedback, uh, in the, in the upcoming episode. And we were talking about giving feedback to each other in at mm. university. And that's yeah. really something crucial that you, um, especially now that you're still together, you can really take that opportunity and kind of like hone your skills with each other because it's a safe environment, hopefully safe environment. I don't know. Yeah, I don't I think know so. how, how all you feel about it. It's each other. definitely safe that compared to an, actual, <laughs> to an actual assignment. That so. is very true. Yeah. Um, I really love that at university, we learned about the business part of interpreting because by the end of this you're all going to be interpreters and you're all going to know how to interpret when you're in the booth but then all of a sudden it's like hey i have to you know draft a quote i have to send an invoice i have to do this i have to do that or what do you do when a client calls you and then we actually we got didn't like a have little... anything of that actually. we did and <laughs> i am incredibly and eternally thankful for that and then we also exactly. got like a little cheat sheet like when the client calls you you're like okay when is the assignment where is the assignment yeah. what mode and it's kind of just like a checklist that you can run through because especially in the beginning when you don't have the routine yet and a client calls you you're like oh my god it's a client. What do, yeah. what, do, what, do, what, do, what do I do? Of course, you'll say yes. Yeah, yeah of course, you, you just say then yes. Then you forget then, to ask about all the important exactly. questions. Yeah. And I mean, it's happened to it happened to us in the beginning still. Like, you still get those calls from the client and you're like, yes, I can do it. And then you're like, oh, crap, I forgot to ask when it is and where it is and what it is. And <laughs> so those things will happen. They're totally fine. It's just part of the whole growing up process. Um, not that you're not growing up, but growing up in the profession. Um, but those things I, I'm really very, very grateful for. And, um, so we didn't have a lot of, we didn't have any business stuff at university at all, I think, but that's where the professional associations come in because right. th those skills, I, I, I picked up a, a little bit of them, but I, p I picked them up from colleagues and, and the professional associations. Yeah. They just picked up the slack for the university. <laughs> yeah. Well. And that's again, why you have these, these mentoring the schemes and those things yeah. are really, really great. If you exactly. feel a little bit unsure, there's also tons of workshops out there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. We do actually have a module on business and how to get mm. started. And this comes with a placement as well. Mm. So when the students That's leave great. the university, they've done three interpreting assignments, one which is a, to shadow an interpreter at work, and two is to interpret. And they've got to write a report about That's this. brilliant. Uh, so there is a reflection behind the whole process. So when you get your first assignment, it's not really your first assignment mm. as such, it's actually your fourth one. Um, so I think this is quite an asset. Yeah. But in addition to this, and I've got uh, Carla, who's next to me, we've got the ambassador scheme for, for interpreting studies. So when graduates uh, graduates, instead of feeling, oh my God, what's going to happen to me? And by myself, you know, mm. how come I come out of my kitchen, as my mom would say, <laughs> you know, uh, we've got the, this, the scheme where you can come back to university as much as you want. You can be an ambassador. You give, you give us 30 hours of your time to support the new students. And in exchange, we give you access to the advanced conference interpreting classes, which are normally a thousand three hundred pounds. Mm. Um, and so there is still a, a form of support uh, for, uh, for students. But at the same time, what's the, the most valuable, I would say, is that when um, all ambassadors come together before the class and we talk about interpreting assignments, what did you get? Uh, mm. uh, how much was the rate? Should I have accepted that? You know, so there's a whole of discussions about uh, these opportunities out there. Um, and in addition to this, my final, my final point would be to bring the professional associations to the university. So yes. here they all come to the university. So it's a little bit less daunting when you think, of a professional association as, as a person who represents yeah. the association, you've already spoken to that person, you know where to start. Uh, so then you, the follow-up stage, which is to attend an event, is a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. So I would say that that's quite good. And when students from London Met go to an event, they all tell each other, because we've got this Google community where we share yeah. our information. And so at least you don't go by yourself. Uh, so yeah. you go as a group as well. And I think that's, that's quite a good idea as well. That is a really good idea. And I think that's also something, because you were asking what we would do differently if we went to university again I remember very distinctly in the very beginning it was kind of like we were all doing our own thing so if we had I don't know business interpreting assignment um, we so in, in in class obviously all dry run everybody would do their own little preparation and we would basically have like 15 glossaries that were like pretty much identical but everybody had spent five hours on the glossary and then eventually I think it took us about 
four months into the course when we realized, hey, we can actually split the workload and make it a lot easier for everybody. And I think that really goes with the whole Google community, with sharing the information. At the end of the day, when you guys get out of here, you're going to be each other's colleagues. Obviously, you're also going to be competing with each other in some sort of way in the market, but you're still going to be working together. So I think that exchange is really crucial. And Going back, if I could go back, I would tell myself, listen, you can actually share the workload because you're all going to be in this together anyways. Yeah. And going back to technology, actually, this year for the first time, we tried something a little bit different. Um, before the course started, I assigned all these students who had a place on the course. Um, I assigned um, and it, uh, some work to do. But the work to do involved a lot of technology, so they had to upload uh, their work on the Google Drive. They had right. to uh, have a glossary that they had shared with others. They had to have a, a presentation, film it, upload it to YouTube. So um, before the course started, I made them uh, engage with all kinds of collaborative tools already. That's great. Um, and so when we start, it's, I mean, every week it's common practice with the homework. You know, you, you do your speech on, on YouTube and, you know, you upload it and, you know, I, I get the link and I mark it. And this week for the first week, actually the speeches we're doing as a homework are going to go on speech pool mm. so uh, you know you go That's even great. further where you give what you've done in class you know to the wider community which i think is absolutely essential yeah Agreed. i agree i fully agree and actually i can tell you now that uh, with the colleagues that i work with in germany especially the ones kind of our age group like we all do glossaries together like i think there's no one who doesn't participate in like i still am quite old-fashioned i use google sheets kind of like excel glossaries um and Not yeah you. <laughs> I, I, know. I just felt a side eye from the left but um yeah like nobody doesn't participate in that because obviously it helps all of you like if you guys use the same terminology if you don't have to do all the work yourself like it's just exactly. a win-win you, you can share the load yeah, yeah. it's just great mm -hmm. so. That's what I do differently. What would you do differently, Alex? <laughs> I'm going to be a bit controversial here. I actually wouldn't want to go back to university. <laughs> I mean, that it was is controversial. Yeah, it was good though, and it was fun. But you know, it's kind of nice to, uh, yeah. No, I, I think to make some money. Yeah. What would I don't know what I would do differently. Um, maybe go to a, to another university. I don't know. It's difficult <laughs> to say. That is controversial. <laughs> yeah. Just to oh, see my alma mater here. I know. Let's move on to the Let's next Let's move question. on swiftly to the next question. <laughs> that, that was a fun one as well, because yeah. we covered that, um, I think, recently in one of our other yeah. episodes. What kind of speakers do you find most difficult to interpret? And I think that the sort of ad hoc reply by most interpreters would be, well, the fast ones, apparently. But I'm going to go with the slow ones. Yeah. I Because sometimes you have these sort of slow talkers who start a sentence and... <laughs> then mm. yeah exactly <laughs> and then I, I always i say jokingly to mike because i just mute the mic and say well i'm gonna get a cup of coffee and, one, and <laughs> <laughs> um so I, I think those are actually more difficult especially when you don't really know what what they're getting at where they're going and maybe that that's maybe they're not you know using their their most um the language that they feel most comfortable with and then it can be it can be a real drag <laughs> yeah i so Fully agree. Whereas with, with a real quick speaker, you can still do gisting and you can get, you know, the, the main points across and you can, which is still, you know, it's still terrifying and, it, and it's still quite challenging to to get the gist and to get mm. that across and to not be completely overwhelmed and, and feeling like you're being run over by a truck. But but I think yeah. that's something that, again, you kind of get used to it. Like, because when the speaker is very fast, you over time get better at kind of dissecting what he's saying and not be overwhelmed. I think mm -hmm. you kind of improve when it comes to the information processing part. Whereas if the speaker is slow, you're just sitting there and you're like, good God, please just <laughs> give me a verb. Give me anything. Yeah. I just need something. Yeah. Yeah. So slow speakers are. Or speakers who read off the Bavarian mining laws. Mm. Those are also great. Yeah. yeah. The reading. But that's, the reading. A, that's a thing. That's, that's a, thing. a thing, unfortunately. That's not going to change anything. The thing, though, and that's an advantage, actually, when you're in the room, when you're not doing remote work, is that people, of course, see if there's a really quick talk and you and you have the audience mm. on your side it's and then they'll really feel for the interpreter and they'll root for you you know and if you do a good job yeah. that actually that they'll really you know pull their hats off to you so you still don't get standing fun. ovations i found are you are you What's, being politically correct and not going over the subject of uh, tough accents well we can get into accents of course i, I was i was actually <laughs> trying to avoid it a little i bit. know you are <laughs> <laughs> um but um, yeah, I mean, some, sometimes speakers they're not they're not doing they're not doing it to to annoy the interpreters or their audience. Sometimes 
the language that they would be most comfortable with just isn't available. Mm. I mean, just speaking of my experience now, because in, in the European institutions, um, you, you have all these 23, I think, official languages, but not every meeting has full language coverage. Um, so often in meetings, you have um, just five or six languages, to, depending on what kind of meeting it is. And sometimes you have uh, asymmetric interpreting. That means you have more passive than active languages and stuff like that. So maybe the whatever the Greek or the Maltese delegate, they can, they can speak the language, but they can't listen to their language in interpreting. So that makes it difficult for them. Um, and I'm not saying this to, you know, to, to put the blame on them. Sometimes they just don't have the choice, but of course mm -hmm. a difficult accent makes it, makes it more difficult for the interpreter as well. Um, the advantage is though, um, for example, when, when we have German delegates who speak English, the advantage for us then is <laughs> that we, we know that kind of German way of thinking, you know, it's probably similar for you with French people, you know, you mm -hmm. know how they think and, and then you, you kind of know what, what, what structure they use, what kind of syntax, and then you can anticipate much more. But if you have someone, I don't know, maybe you have, uh, a delegate from, I don't know, Indonesia or whatever, and they're speaking English, and th that can be a challenge. Yeah, I think I, there's you guys all work with English as a working language, so mm. you're just going to be screwed eventually at, <laughs> at one conference. Cause it's the disadvantage of being a lingua franca, yeah. That's the whole thing. Like You just have people from all over the world at all levels of English presenting in English, so it's just going to be part and parcel of working with English. On the flip side, it really helps you talk to clients because they're like, well, why do we actually need interpreters? Like everybody speaks English. And then you're like, yeah, but would you understand this financial presentation if somebody came in from, Jonathan isn't here, so I can say from Scotland, you know, <laughs> somebody came in, would you understand that? Or would you not prefer I interpret this into French for you, to yeah. perfect French and you understand? And it's like, oh yeah, actually now that you mention it. So that also kind of helps you talk, to, and helping the client understand why we're useful and amazing people. Yeah. And then, of course, even within the same country, hint, Spain, you get sometimes a very interesting and broad variety of accents. So that, that must be a challenge oh, yeah. from time to time. Even in Germany, right, Alex? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you no, want to no, no. you know, go into that, feel free to. Well, he pushed us into the whole accent <laughs> thing, right? So payback. I'm saying because in particular in, in the UK, regional accents are yeah. something else. They're, wo they're wonderful, but they can yeah. be quite a challenge. Yeah. Indeed. Um, yeah, I have fond memories of works council meetings in the UK with delegates from East London, from yeah. God knows where Newcastle. And I was just sitting there and I was like, hmm. just waiting for them to speak English. <laughs> <laughs> that never happened. And he thought it was but, probably Gaelic or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then eventually... Oh, I actually right. have a really fun story about Spanish. Spanish. I remember. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> I have a fun story. I was once at a, at a conference in Dublin with three booths, French booth, German booth, Spanish booth. And they all had to present like some um, parking space concepts. And at the very end, there was like a spitball kind of session where they could win an award for presenting the best concept. And there was a, and we'd obviously been working with Relay with the three booths for the, it was like a three day conference. And at the very end, a Spanish delegate came on and they only had like five minutes. So you couldn't really find your footing in the presentation and it was very very kind of rapid fire and uh, she started speaking and we all just like automatically went into the relay channel waiting for the English from the Spanish booth and then nothing came and I looked at my booth and she looked at me and we looked at the French booth they were panicking and then we looked at the Spanish booth and they were just like peacefully interpreting into Spanish and then I flipped back and I was like oh crap this is English <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that was fun but it happens it happens not getting into things like Portuñol and uh, because I, I, I can probably share this episode too. We had a, a meeting where there was a Portuguese delegate, but there was no Portuguese interpreting. And so he was, he was nominally speaking Spanish, but it was this kind of, this, this kind of mix, I think it was, we can probably, you know, this better Hugo, which is called Portuñol. So it's a Portuguese trying to fake Spanish basically. <laughs> and we, we actually did have, we did have a Spanish booth and they actually put it into quote unquote proper Spanish for all the other colleagues to work from. That was a bit controversial, but a very, very useful. Very, very useful. Practical. I believe it. <laughs> yeah. Thank goodness. Well, you have to adapt, right? With what yeah, there is. Exactly. You what you said about yeah, delegates speaking globish and suddenly mm. you're just like, well, you know, I'll just take whatever I can get in and build that sentence. You know, it really helps when you have a big presentation in front of you, and then you just kind of because you always understand bits and pieces. It's never happened that I'd, the figures, <laughs> yeah. So you get the numbers, or I don't yeah. know when they pre when they were presenting this parking space concept. Like you could see the pictures, and then you kind of understood bits and pieces of what you she was saying, and then you, see. you kind of like put that together and describe mm -hmm. what you see. And then once you understand the bits, you just kind of work those in there. So. You know, you kind of make it work. Again, like the swan, you have to be very 
calm, cool, calm, and collected. Poker face. Poker <laughs> face yeah, that's half yeah. the battle. Is the exactly. poker face, the poker voice. Yeah, we can probably get through a few sort of rapid fire questions. Uh, yes, because we've been at this for. We don't, we're happy to be here, but we don't want to keep you for too long because it's Saturday. Um, but we've we've spoken a little bit about. You know what? The next one is the oh, this yeah, that was an interesting question. I don't know if the person wants to reveal who asked the question. Um, <laughs> Have you encountered any problems specific to the languages that you interpret? We can maybe get this get into this real quickly um, be because my initial thought was that usually the the problem um, the problem isn't really that much about language, but very often it's about the thinking and the culture behind it, and that can be interesting when you have again just just picking on the Indonesians for some reason. If you have an Indonesian delegate who has to speak English and has to you know maybe explain certain concepts that are very specific to their sort of everyday life or work um, and that, that can be challenging and, and of course there's the, the, uh, the infamous verb at the end of the German sentence or actually the, the negation at the end of the sentence which is much more tricky than the verb I think um, but apart from that I mean we're, in, we're interpreters and we're trained professionals so I don't know if that's necessarily a huge, uh, huge problem right um, yeah and I think we've spoken a little bit to how we integrate new technologies into our professional lives so terminology would be a big thing everything related to communication exactly. I guess yeah so yeah if you have any follow up questions we can get to them in a minute have you added any yeah you can maybe mention this have you ad added any new languages to your combination since initial training and how did you go about doing this and how long did it take because you, you have been working on Italian but not necessarily with the purpose of adding it to your combination yeah I've been working on Italian but more because um, I like the language I don't think I'm still not 100% sure if I'm if I'm targeting like working language proficiency or at least like passive language proficiency would it um, make business sense for you to add Italian that's not the question at all. Right? not really no yeah. no no not but that's, one bit. that's something you have to consider you know if, yeah. it, it's fine just learning a language because it's fun you know be, of course, that's great. But um, if, if you're thinking at adding a language to your combination, you might want to take into consideration where you're based, if it makes yes. sense, because it is an investment in terms yeah. of time, in terms of money, just sort of cognitive resources overall. Um, so I think that that would be something. And, and for you, it's just been a fun thing, right? It's just a been bit fun. Of travel yeah, and, yeah, just, just travel. A I mean, I live in Munich, so this is basically still it's part basically of Italy. Italy. <laughs> it's basically Italy. Uh, and I just like the language. So for me, it was kind of more like a leisure time project. And it really wouldn't make any business sense for me to have a passive Italian because... I have literally never in my life been at a conference yeah. where it was just passive tricky Italian. In Germany, yeah. Yeah, it's tricky in Germany. In Germany, so much English, German, and very little else. And I think the Italian work is mostly covered by Italians living in Germany, I suppose. Correct. Yeah, yeah mostly. For example, in Germany, it makes a lot of sense if you don't have English as a passive language, it makes a lot of sense to add English because a lot of the conferences will be partially in English and then you yeah. can interpret into French, Arabic, whatever have you. And some won't even have an English booth, right? So, What do you mean? I think that what is the mean? thing that sometimes there's you, you work by actively, so you don't have an English booth necessarily. You'll have German, English, English, German, and then maybe French, German, German, French, but no English booth per se. Is that right? Does it make sense? No. I'm taking us off topic. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> You've lost me on that one. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> but, uh, but what's interesting, we can probably daisy chain the other questions is what languages are in high demand for interpreters? And then, mm. you know, the, the dreadful answer is it depends. It depends on, on where you are and which market you're based mm -hmm. in and which kind of segment of the market you want to go into. So, for example, conference interpreting may have completely different language requirements than uh, community interpreting, for example. Yeah. So I think even if you're based in London, if, if you're going into community, I guess it, it would be more exotic, quote unquote, exotic languages that, that would be much more useful than French, say. So I think. Yeah, I agree. Do you see, yeah, that actually is the case. I, I, can, I can confirm. Okay, <laughs> great. Even the French is using uh, for a lot of the African languages, which yeah. are yeah. not uh, available in the market yeah that's right um but you've also learned a ton of languages like no. at the eu you've <laughs> learned uh, romanian no i actually already started with romanian oh you started before that yeah yeah ah. I, already, I already started with romanian um but what's specific is that we we only learn up to the sea level so we could sea level that's interesting to sea language level is what i wanted to say mm. on sea level <laughs> <laughs> um talking about swans um 
Yeah, so I think it's it's kind of different because we we only learn it as a passive language, mm. so it, it would be different. But uh, again, that goes to show you really have to look at where you are based, where you want to be based. So maybe you want to go somewhere else. Maybe you want to go back to you know if if you if you're here just for university, if coming from a different country. Country, do you want to go back? Do you want to go to a different place altogether? And then you have to do some market research and see what languages are in in demand. If that's a good fit, yeah. there again, if you can you can approach um, professional associations or colleagues based there um, to find out more. Absolutely, but it really depends. There's no clear cut answer to this. It really depends, and also the thing is. Um, don't underestimate the time investment that a third language takes because at the moment for my Italian, like I'm just dabbling, I'm reading a book here or there, maybe watching a movie and that's that's all I'm doing. Duolingo. Duolingo, I like to do that as well, as Alex has painfully <laughs> found out. Um, and I've talked to a good friend of mine in Germany who is Italian native, married to a German guy, but also has English as a B language. So she basically has to keep up her three languages because obviously your mother tongue should be pretty good. And all your other w working languages, especially if they're B, should also be really, really good. So she has to constantly keep up all three languages. And if you're established in the market, if you have a lot of work, if you even translate on the side, doing that for three languages is an astounding feat. And to this very day, I have no idea how she finds the time to do all of that. And then actually going into conferences where um, she uses all three of them, because maybe she doesn't need the relay from the English presenter through the German booth so she can do German into Italian. She can take him directly, but then she, of course, also has to know all the English terminology and not just the German and the Italian. So the workload is exponentially, well, I don't think exponentially is the right word, but it's a lot more. It's not mathematically it's accurate. Not, yeah, but. No. what we do language in, right? <laughs> fine. For a reason. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, so don't underestimate that if you add multiple languages as, act. well, also as passive languages. I think mm -hmm. that applies even to passive yeah, languages. Of yeah, of course. So. Yeah. Terminology That's is a good good thing to bear in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how long do you think it takes an average to reach professional competence as an interpreter? I think that would be a good question for Danielle, actually, <laughs> <laughs> because um, I, I think it kind of depends on what you mean by professional competence. Because once you're through this and you get your final diploma, you will be able to do this. And um, as we kind of got into when we spoke about our first interpreting jobs, um, it still means a lot of peddling you know, down there and keeping a straight face up here. Um, but you, you have the skills required to do it. Um, what I think changes over time is that you, you get more comfortable with the job yeah. and you build up the routines that just make it easier. So you, you don't find the jobs as training as straining as you do in the beginning. I think that's the, the, for me, at least that's the thing that really made a difference over the years. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know what, yeah, if there's any research on this, maybe. I don't know. Mm, well, I would say that uh, a year is quite short to train conference interpreters or even public service interpreters at, at quite a professional level. I would say the most important thing that you can do on the course is to get some good habits on regular practice. So I find that, and here you're talking about research, I'm referring to Elizabeth Tiselius, mm -hmm. where, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, when she actually demonstrated that um, a group of interpreters were tested uh, three years after they, they had graduated, oh, right. it was graduation, mm -hmm. and they, their level hadn't improved yeah. uh, so much because they they were not practicing for many interpreters their idea of looking after their skills is to add a language to look at current affairs to uh, read in the language but they're not doing interpreting practice as such and so if you don't have a lot of work at the beginning you can lose these skills quite you know quite a lot so I would say for me what's the most important is to give my students really good habits of regular practice when they are on the course so when you leave the course well you can join the ambassador scheme and come here again and practice you know that's one thing <laughs> But you need to have that habit of regular practice really inside you. You need to, it's embedded in your daily life, basically. Mm. Uh, and I think that uh, that is the only way you're going to look after your skills and you're going to grow as a professional interpreter, especially at the beginning where you don't have a lot of interpreting assignments. Yeah, and I think one thing that you get out of the training as well is the sort of the social network that you have as sort of fellow students. Um, and especially in the beginning when you don't have that many jobs and so maybe you're not quite ready yet to dive into a professional association quite yet um you you can just you know keep up that practice group i mean that's what mm -hmm. uh, for example there's one in brussels where um students and recent graduates still come together every week to practice to give each other feedback um and that's really super useful and i think more more of us should go there as well 
if there's time. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> time permitting. Yeah. And there are some groups online as well. Yeah, there's online groups uh, as well. So I've yeah. got some students exactly. who graduated about six or seven years ago, and they still practice on the weekly basis. Yeah. Um, wow. So it's a habit they had habit. on the course, and you know they still do it. Um, so it works. It's got to be something that you enjoy doing, and I think as the time goes by, you become good friends, and yeah, part of the connection is about afterwards. you know yeah. talking about you know yourself or you know what you're doing, and then practice you know is added uh, to to that time. Yeah. So it's it becomes you know friendship and you know it's it's on a personal level as well as, as on a professional level it it really helps you grow. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Is Renata is are you she's here? not here. She's she, not here. She's okay. Mm -hmm. um, but she asked the question: How and where can you find potential clients? And I think that also goes back to to that kind of community that you're formed because as I mentioned earlier. While you will be competing if you work in the same languages to a certain extent, you're still going to be working together. So um, a lot of the jobs, well, actually, hmm, let me not say anything wrong. I don't know if it's most of the jobs, but definitely half of the jobs you will get from colleagues, um, at least in the German market. I know in the UK it's very agency dominated, so it might be working differently here. But again, it still works if and if you're working for agencies that a colleague recommends you to a project manager and then they contact you. So you'll still kind of roundabout get the get the work through the colleagues and um, especially in the beginning because all of you guys will be trying to find potential clients or agencies will be applying here and there and again if you share that if you spread the love um, <laughs> it kind of helps out everybody and it might sound a bit like favoritism but at the end of the day you will work with people if you can help it who you like working with uh, and that's just how it's going to be so if you guys actually find that you gel together, you're obviously going to give each other more jobs. And I think that's just kind of natural, but obviously it's not always going to work out that way. And um, yeah, just go out there, be active, look at events, go through um, event websites that kind of list different events, look at the conferences. Maybe you can get a hold of the conference organizer, or maybe there's an event agency behind it and you can contact them. So that's a good, that's a good way to do it. Um, there's also these sorts of passive ways you can do it i don't i've never mm -hmm. found them particularly helpful but you can sign up to like, uh, directories like or? yeah like directories like pros yeah. or like translators cafes some job inquiries will come through there yeah or um, link linkedin maybe if those, or yeah. linkedin like those kinds of things there's another one i forgot the name of um but there's a few of those sort of directories out there i've received a few job offers they've never worked out in, in that way for me but maybe they will for you you know maybe it depends on the language combination and depends you don't on the industry as well that exactly. you want to work it depends in. on the industry yeah. and you don't have to do a lot for that like you just set up your profile and then somebody can contact you through that so i think those are are kind of easy wins if do you, you will do you find that you get a lot of jobs through the um directories of the professional associations i.e go faculty in your case I don't know. You don't know. No, the, because the clients I, uh, won't necessarily tell you. The and clients maybe sometimes you don't the ask clients. Them. Yeah, I don't ask them. Sometimes they do tell, uh, and then I'm always very grateful because basically one job already kind of covers the membership fee of a year, so that you know is it's kind of pays for itself literally. But that maybe um, you could add that, um, or you could add that to your checklist, to your phone checklist for clients. You you can ask them how they found you. Yes. That, can, that can be interesting information. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. I've been meaning to do that. <laughs> See. Write it, write it down. <laughs> I know. Mental note. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mental note. Is uh, Lilia here? Well, I had three questions there, so I'm just going to summarize them for you. So, first of all, nice to meet you. Nice to obviously. meet you too. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> and uh, um, I just had uh, a few questions there, sort of like came up from what I'm doing. Well, the most important one is about aging. Okay. Recently, we had a conference, mock conference in our course. And my question is, you know, is there such a thing as ageism in interpreting? Like, you know, how do you collaborate? Like, you know, you interpreters of different age groups. And do you think that, um, you know, for someone who starts their interpreting career a little bit later on in life, do they have the same chances? Like, you know, are they, are they as, um, efficient you know because it's also it also involves technology and other things and mental capabilities and things like that um another thing is you know what do you do in situations when your mind goes blank you know how do you deal with that and also another situation what if you get a phone call in the evening and they tell you oh we want you to do an interpreting job tomorrow okay would you accept it would you not accept it and why Hmm. Thank All you. Right. There's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd actually like to start with the ageism bit. Um, yeah, that's, that's great. So, 
first of all, one thing I really like about working in interpreting is the flat hierarchies. So usually it doesn't really matter whether you're a very experienced colleague or you're, um, for, for example, in, in, in my case, or whether, whether you've been a European official for 40, I haven't been for 40 years, but some of my colleagues have. So it doesn't really matter all that much because when, once you're in the booth, you're a team and your job is to, you know, make communication happen yeah. and help your, your clients. And that kind of unites interpreters. And it doesn't really matter whether you're new or, or experienced or whatever. It doesn't matter that much, at least, because you, you're there to do the same job. And, and for some people in, in our context in an institution, it can be difficult because they like to have career steps and they like to sort of move forward and then move to yeah. higher ranks. And, um, that does happen mostly in terms of pay. But still, even if you've been doing this for 40 years, you're doing the same meetings as, somebody who just started out. Um, and I like that. I like these flat hierarchies. And I think the same goes for age. Um, I think it doesn't really matter if you're um, 60 years old or 25 years old, um, you're still doing the same work. But I think what, what there is a difference in that in how you approach um, the work. I think your question was a little bit different in that you said um, you were asking about starting out a little bit later, I think. Um, I don't necessarily think that's that's a problem um, because I think um, if you're a more experienced, shall we say, or mature person, you bring a lot of other things to the table mm. that young people may not necessarily have. And I think that overall probably just evens out. Um, and and I think um, the, the age difference is really not a big issue in interpreting, in my personal experience. Um, what, what I was what I was about to say is that the way you approach the work changes. I think that's what I hear from colleagues who are sort of nearing retirement. They do say that they get tired more easily um, and that they they don't necessarily want to do five five day weeks uh, in interpreting, which can happen in institutions. Um, so sometimes they switch to freelancing to have a bit more control of their own time and, and control about how much they work. Um, but they can compensate sort of the 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 fatigue that comes easily uh, comes comes earlier with uh, routines and with experience. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that an older interpreter um, doesn't work as well. I think they just work differently. Yeah. And I just want to hijack a phrase that Jonathan usually uses, uses because he says, um, well, the, the hijacked phrase goes, we are language specialists with specialties attached. So I might be really good at IT or automotive technology and an older person or a more experienced person coming into the interpreting space might be an automotive specialist with language skills attached. So, you know, they kind of compensate the, the lack of education, formal education in interpreting by being absolute experts in that certain field. And then... I don't know, coming back to the mining law, none of us are experts in that. So that, that again, <laughs> that again is a very egalitarian like playing field. So I think then it really becomes about, as you were saying, just in the booth, we're all the same anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, and also I think because I, in Munich, I have a, 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 a more experienced colleague that I work with quite frequently. And it's kind of a, it's a nice exchange because you've you've mentioned the technolo the technology part and obviously I have an edge on him when it comes to that, but I've shown him a lot of things and he's actually quite open to that. And then on the flip side, he's shown me a lot of things. So now we actually organize a lot of events together that he's been doing for years. And he's shown me how to do things more efficiently and more easily that I kind of, I, I got there eventually, but he obviously had figured out a long time ago how to get there much, much e more easily or much more efficiently. So you can really kind of be both benefit from that, that working relationship. Yeah. I don't think it's too, uh, it's, there's, there's an, too, I, an, so too. I, I can't, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's an age that is too old to start interpreting. There we go. Actually, can I um, add that when I've got uh, applicants applying for the job, I've got to test them. And when an applicant is maybe a little bit older, uh, there are certain things that I look at, but it's not always um, to do with skills. It's about ability to get to, to get some feedback and ability to, mm -hmm. to change uh, yeah. one's way of mm -hmm. uh, doing certain things. Uh, so that's one, one aspect. And the second aspect is speed. Um, if they're able to really do um, certain exercises with the right speed. Yeah. Uh, but in, in, um, I would say on the masters, what I really love is to have a mixture of uh, mature students and young interpreters as well, because it's, it complements each other. You know, absolutely. It's brilliant, really yeah. excellent. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. But on the speed thing, I've actually talked to a few colleagues in Munich about that because, and we've covered that on the show as well a few times. Um, and you might have heard this. I speak very fast. I'm just generally in my life. I speak a lot and I speak very fast. And I also speak fast when I'm interpreting, which sometimes really helps if the speaker is quite fast. Um, those, those colleagues, a lot of colleagues that are more experienced slow down considerably. 
with those fast speakers, just because they say they couldn't keep up at that pace, just because they don't have the stamina anymore necessarily, but they compensate it through other techniques so they don't lose the the the, the, the content or the sense or the message. So I think that's it's really interesting discussion to be had about the speed at interpreting and and the push and pull. Mm. I would say it's also the speed with split attention and also looking at notes and speaking at the same time. So I'm, we're just in this testing environment, you know, yeah. so I'm looking at how they can do more than one thing together. Uh, and that when they can, and it's perfectly fine. But sometimes when uh, there's a little bit of uh, stop, stopping, thinking, being mm. flustered, you know, I can feel that this is maybe more age related. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of works with the next right. one there with uh, drawing a blank. <laughs> I was trying to think about this and whether this ever, I think this, this must have happened to, to all of us at some point. Um, I think it's kind of related to the whole thing of stress management and, and calming yourself down. I think when that happens, um, you need to know this, that it can happen and it's, it's fine. And mm. then you just, you maybe turn off the mic for a second, take a deep breath and just go back. If, if you lose a few things, you know. That's okay. It happens. Yeah. It's usually um, the end but of the world. It's really the, the crucial thing really is not to be discouraged, not to be so frustrated that you make a mess of the rest of the shift, right. but that you just push it aside basically and say, okay, I'll do this again. Um, yeah. Or maybe, maybe, you know, I mean, that's the reason why we work in teams. Maybe if, if you're really stuck, that can happen as well. And then hopefully you have a colleague who can pick up the slack and just take over. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, I think that's part of the job as well, that you watch out for these signs for even when you're not, when it's not your shift, that you kind of watch out, um, for these signs from your colleague, if they're maybe, you know, getting really stressed or, or stuck. And yeah, say, absolutely. Should I take over? You just go out and take a breath. Yeah. That happens actually a lot. Especially, that can happen, yeah. And also that goes back to the whole accent thing. You know, sometimes you might find an accent super easy and you might find it very, very difficult. And then you can see your colleague struggling. You can kind of feel that energy when they're struggling. Mm -hmm. And then you can take over, even though you just did a shift because then they might do a little bit longer after that. So I think that works out in that way. And also... Um, that comes with time. The more you work with certain colleagues, the more they know how you operate. And obviously you kind of get a better feel, a better sense and feel for each other. Um, but again, coming back to the numbers, which I'm excellent at, it, <laughs> <laughs> it just sometimes helps if you can see the number. And I've worked with a few colleagues who already know that. So when they like just run through the numbers and we don't get the presentation, they just write them down because then it's kind of like... I know in French it's even worse. In Germany it's just kind of flip, but then in French you have to like do some crazy mathematic <laughs> somersaults and stuff. So, but it just helps, you know, seeing that, and then you could just kind of sit there and you're like, okay, which was that number? And, and then they just write it down, and that already helps you. Um, it can also be really funny though sometimes. So I actually have a little anecdote. <laughs> um, I had a consecutive job where I was drawing a blank, which. Uh, there's nobody there to help you and you, there's no mute button. Oh, yeah. And uh, I was standing in front that of the audience tough. and I, um, yeah, just couldn't think of the word anymore. And luckily it was not a very serious event. It was kind of like a marketing -y event and it was a very small crowd and it was a very familial crowd. So everybody was kind of like one family. And um, yeah, I just couldn't think of the word. I just could not for the life of me think of that word. And you know that mental thing I'm sure you guys have experienced it when you're interpreting and you know exactly which direction you're headed in and you see the roadblock and you know you're gonna you're gonna run into the hat on it's like a train wreck yeah it's like a happen. train wreck in slow motion and you're like I need to I need to take a left turn but you can't and then you just full on head into that and then I was kind of stuck on that word and then somebody from the audience just said it's humble it was the word <laughs> it was the word humble that I just could not for the life of me think of and I was like thank you very and much you go, and then oh, no. and then you get a good laugh and then yeah. everybody is even happier that and then eases just the kind of tension yeah. yeah if you get a good laugh yeah. that's true mm. and I mean we're humans you know we're not machines we're not doing machine interpreting so <laughs> uh -huh. It's yeah. And don't beat yourself up. That's another thing that I want to mention. Yeah. Because I think it's especially important for students. We're all going to have crappy days. So when you've had a crappy day, look at what you did, what you could do differently and what you could improve on next time. But if you've had the most impossible speaker, that person, you're probably not going to be interpreting again. So don't beat yourself up for not having provided the most excellent interpreting ever, because sometimes it's just not possible and you just do the best you can. Mm. And then you just move on. I think what's important in that regard is also when you get feedback um, yeah. right here from your peers or from from Danielle or the other trainers. Um, what is important is that you 
do not just write down the negative stuff, also write down the positive stuff. That's super important to to keep you going, to keep you motivated. Um, so like the, the same, peer feedback, right? Yeah, yeah for yeah. example, or feedback from, from trainers. And I think you could do the same for your first jobs is kind of write down, okay, what went well, what didn't go so well. And if you do this over, over time, I think you'll, you'll see how you improve and evolve uh, without, you know, beating your up, beating yourself yeah, up absolutely. <laughs> unnecessarily. Okay, just real quick on uh, the overnight jobs. Oh, yeah. Um, I think we'll have different perspectives here. So for me, it, it happens um, quite often um, because what it's like at the institutions is basically you, you go to go to the booth every day is like other people go to the office. And that necessarily involves with, with the high number of meetings that we have every day is that there will be change and that, you know, things get canceled or things there will be a new meeting popping up. And sometimes you'll just get a few hours um, of advance notice. But the advantage for us is that all the meetings happen in the EU bubble, if you will. So once you have done some of those meetings, you know, all the institutions, you know, what's going on right now, you know, the typical structure of a meeting. So you have actually much less preparation to do. And you, you can, I mean, I don't have a choice anyway, I have to do the jobs. I, it's not like I can turn them down, because then I get get fired. So I think, not a good fit. I think it's a, a slightly different situation. For, whereas you, you probably, I think you, you could probably turn it down unless maybe it's a very good client. And yeah, but is, that, then is that a factor maybe? If, if it's a very good client, then I'm happy to take the job if I'm available. Because if it's a very good client, like I know the client, I know the type of meetings that they have. Hmm. I know the terminology. So then you, you can want to kind keep of, the client. You I obviously <laughs> also want to keep the client, fingers yeah. crossed. Um, but if it's a very good client and you're available, like you obviously take the job because you're familiar with the subject matter with the client. So I think then it's not really an issue. It's never happened to me that I got a completely random call saying, we need you tomorrow morning. Actually, that's not true. One of my very good clients, <laughs> go. one of my very, very good clients actually called me one hour before they needed me. And I was saying, well, it was the summer, so I was wearing flip-flops and shorts. And I was saying, well, I'm out. I'm looking like this. I have no idea what you're doing. If this is, I can come and do the best because you obviously need someone. Otherwise, you wouldn't be calling me an hour before desperately. But if you're happy with what I can bring to the table, then I'm happy to do it for you. Um, actually, I was wearing shoes, like sneakers, not flip-flops. Um, not that it makes a big difference. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Did you go in, but, in, in, in sneakers? I went in sneakers, I went in my shorts, and then I came there, and it was a board meeting with the CEO, and, <laughs> and they were very happy, and, they, and they've literally been my best client now for five years. So, you know, sometimes these things can go really wrong, but I think you need to set the right expectation, especially if they're calling you super last minute, and they don't give you any preparation material, then you're saying, okay, well, I can come do and I can best. do the yeah. best that I can, but you need to be aware that it might not be the perfect uh, interpretation because it's just impossible. Yeah, but expectation management. Yeah, expe right? exactly. Mm -hmm. Expectation management. That's exactly what you need to be doing. Yeah, I have similar situations. Sometimes I'm, um, when I'm not in a meeting, I'm on standby. And that means if they call me, I have 30 minutes to get to the meeting. So that kind of limits Holy my crap. options. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes I just, I just keep dressed kind of presentably during mm. the day, even when I'm not working, just to make sure I don't have to, you know. Uh, well, as I'm a, I was on my way to get ice cream. So, yeah, I had different plans. But equally so, if they're calling you and you're not comfortable with the topic, then I would say don't do it. So only only if you feel like it's something that you can perform reasonably well at. Like if I got a call from like a court or anything remotely touching the, the legal subject, I would be saying, oh, sorry, can't do it. I'm fully booked. There is literally no way I could make this meeting But, happen. you know, maybe you can recommend a colleague. But maybe you can or recommend you can a colleague. Say, That's exactly right. I'm happy to do a quick search in the directory. Yeah. And, and you, you always try to be helpful. Yeah. So even if you can't take the job yourself, you can recommend someone you know. Or you can at least say, well, you know, I'll, you, you can go through the directory or, or I'll make a search for you and I'll, yeah. I'll email you a couple of names. Exactly. Um, because that, that even then when you can't take the job yourself, being helpful f to the client might mean that they will call you back even if you couldn't take that job. Yeah. And that's all, that also goes back to what we were saying earlier, that you're basically going to shuffle jobs between each other. You're going to get her a job and she's going to get you a job. So, you know, it's kind of like that give or take in the profession as well. when you explain that, but it's true. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, it's just... Uh, that's how it works, yeah. I would assume like it works the same in other professions. I know in, in yeah. you know, with law firms, it kind of works the same. Like if you're going to like a patent law firm and they don't take your case because it's not patent law, they would refer you on to a different law firm. So it's kind of... Um, yeah, but you're right. It kind of sounds fishy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have uh, one last question. Is uh, that your question, uh, Mohammed? Mohammed, yeah. is that you? Do you want to just um, recap it for us real quick? Yeah. 
Um, so first, thank you for being here. Uh, so my, my questions are, are, are like a bit personal. Um, so the first one is um, how you can get to work at the international level, especially if you if you if you're not living in in Europe or in a Western country. And the second one, um, are there any paid internships uh, at, the, at the international uh, organizations? I know, for example, that the um, European Commission has a scheme for of a, of inter of trainings, paid trainings, yeah. uh, but it doesn't uh, include necessarily um, people f outside of Europe, especially in languages like Arabic, uh, which are not really um, EU languages. Mm. So the second language: Are there any paid language, any paid internships for Arabic speakers, for example, or Chinese speakers? Yeah. Thanks, Mohammed. Mm. Um, yeah, so, so practical steps to get into the international organizations. I, I can't, I can mostly speak for the European institutions, but I think it's similar for the UN mm. and other in, uh, international institutions. Um, they will usually have two cohorts of interpreters, so freelance and staff. Um, and if you want to become a staff interpreter, that usually involves quite a procedure. Um, so for the European institutions, you'll have to apply, you'll have to send in all your paperwork, your diplomas and everything. You'll have to go through a few initial rounds of testing um, for general knowledge, EU knowledge, logical thinking, uh, what did they call it? Numerical reasoning, that kind of thing. And then at, at the, at, yeah, exactly. And then it's at the very end, you'll have the actual interpreting exam. Um, for freelancing, it's a little bit easier because you only have to do the the exam so the accreditation test where you usually have to do both consec and simultaneous they will usually test both um, certainly the eu institutions do um, the positions for staff interpreters are quite rare nowadays um, it's not because there's no demand there is demand it's mostly because of austerity and having to save money that's why there aren't a lot of posts available um, and for freelancers it really depends on the language so i'm not really sure about the arab booth um, how often they do tests um, so you'd have to do a little bit of research with the institutions um, um, Arabic is not an EU language, that's correct, but we still um, we still have booths for non-EU languages like Russian as well or Chinese, because of course sometimes there will be international meetings where we need Chinese, Russian, Arabic, so the big, uh, because they're big languages, of course. Um, um, so we, we still need interpreters for that. Um, they're mostly freelance, um, so that that often means that they're not not even based in Europe, but you, they can still work for the European institutions. When it comes to traineeships, it's it's right the, the Commission and the Parliament both offer um, paid internships. Um, you could also do an internship. I think you can apply for two or three different uh, departments, if you will. That that would be of interest to you. They can't promise you to send you there, but they'll try to take that into consideration. Um, so you can do an internship for example, at DG Interpretation, but it won't be in the booth. It will be in administration. So it will be around interpreting, but it will not be in the booth because we cannot provide that. Um, what you can do is, um, if you get an internship with the commission, is you can do a little bit of shadowing and just follow interpreters around, uh, you know, maybe go into a dummy booth, that kind of thing. So that I think that, that will be possible. Um, but I'm not sure whether these are open to non-EU citizens. I'd have to... So I take it you're not an EU citizen? No. So I'd have to check for that. I'm not not sure but you could try at the un for example i'm not sure if they have i suppose they have paid internships i don't know how well they are paid or if, no you don't okay might be wrong then um but maybe that's a question we can crowdsource a little bit uh maybe see if we can get some feedback it's not paid it's not paid so even if you go to new york it's on your own money wow hmm. wow yeah, that's actually right. I have a friend who's in the Russian booth, and she went to New York to uh, work on at the at the uh, at the European Union at the United Nations. <laughs> yeah. um, maybe I can reach out to her and see how she was doing and how she kind of got in there. It was the, the Russian booth, so again, that could be um, of interest to you as well. And I'm, and I'm wondering booth. if there's a way to to find a, a probably a freelance interpreter who's willing to take you on or for a couple of weeks maybe just yeah. to shadow them or, or follow them to a few I mean it's always a bit tricky because you, as, a, as an interpreter you will then have to ask your client whether it's okay to bring someone and usually it is probably okay they, I don't know if they mind unless it's something confidential but um, maybe that's an option to to ask an already established interpreter whether you can shadow them for a while 
I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. We've got one of our students who's actually uh, an intern right now in Brussels mm -hmm. with DJ interpretation. Okay. And uh, she's been given a few opportunities to be in the booth and yeah. to do some practice as well, which is good. At the UN, it's a little bit different. Yeah. Um, but the UN is also open to uh, offer them a booth practice, um, even when you're not coming within the university visit. So you can contact them and do some demi booth practice. Uh, there are some internships, that's true. But yes, they are not paid. I confirm that. Um, but last Last year, for example, no, no, it was a year before we had some virtual classes with the UN with the um, head of the Arabic uh, booth, and that was very good as well. So there are some opportunities, but even if they are not visible on the website, uh, when you raise an interest and you speak to the right person, some opportunities may occur. So it's just a matter of voicing out uh, your strong desire to do um, an internship or to spend some time and, you know, with the Arab. Arabic booth or with the Arabic colleagues, you know, and um, you'd be surprised, but people are very much willing to help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that I, I think that's a really good point. I think um, just talk to like your lecturers that have your working language, just approach other conference interpreters that you might have already gotten to know at some sort of event. Maybe they spoke at a conference and you can approach them because chances are, I, I, I in fact know two interpreters from the UK with Arabic and they work a lot internationally. They work in Egypt, they work kind of all around Europe uh, because they get set on these various missions. Um, yeah, just, just kind of talk to them. Don't, make it sound like you're kind of like hounding them to give you a job just you know kind of show interest and yeah just um play it cool yeah, exactly <laughs> play it cool thank you poker, that's uh, a good poker summary. face poker face yeah yeah, yeah. Rah, rah. yeah. And in london there is the international maritime organization where you will be going in the second semester and so the arabic is one of the official languages there so obviously that's another opportunity um but i have to tell you that when i when i look for an arabic tutor on the course i I'm so desperate because there are so few of them and they are fully Even booked all the time. In, so, hmm? you know, um, the, you know, the Arabic booth is, or the Arabic team of conference interpreters in the UK is very small and there's quite a lot of work for Arabic. Mm. Um, so, you know, I'm sure that uh, you'll find what you're looking for. All right. I think that was the last question. Yep. It was. Does anybody have anything that they want to <laughs> say? <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, sure. When you started uh, started interpreting training or you started working as a professional interpreter, uh, I mean, when in your very early days of your career, uh, what was your goal and has it changed and what is your goal as an interpreter? That's a really like interesting question. question. Yeah. That's a really good one. Um, at the very beginning, my goal was pretty simple. I wanted to be able to live off of interpreting because I don't like translation. I don't have the patience for it. I'm, <laughs> I'm not really good at it either. Hot take. <laughs> um, so my goal was to just be able to live off of interpretation. And that goal has been met. I can do that now. Um, But I don't actually know, know what my goal is at the moment. And we've been talking about that, you know, even privately, even with other friends that I have that work in the profession, because it is such a flat hierarchy. Eventually, as soon as you have a certain workload. You just what, keep going, what, what right? Kind yeah. Of, kind of, yeah, you just kind of keep mm. going and you kind of just chug along. And then, yeah, what's the what's the end goal? That's a really good question. And I'm not sure that has to be. I don't be have an, an answer. Yeah, I'm not sure that has to be an end goal. Um I can only speak for myself. So I really fell into interpre interpreting. I I was always good at languages and I was bad at everything else. So I knew I had, to, and I, I knew I didn't want to become a language teacher. So I kind of flipped to the university syllabus and said, okay, interpreting, that sounds like fun. And then I just fell into it and, and I really enjoyed it. Mm. Um, so, but there was never, I never, it's not like I always knew I wanted to definitely become an interpreter or work for the European institutions or whatever. I, I mean, I just went step by step basically and one thing led to the next so that yeah. it was it wasn't really intentional um so and i've never been much of a goal person myself um to be honest and I, i read this interesting thing the other day um from someone on the internet of course where they said um people are not nouns they are verbs so for example when i meet someone at a social gathering and they ask me what i do um usually of course i'll say i'm an interpreter but i actually i actually much prefer 
saying what I do. So I interpret, I make a podcast that mm. kind, of, kind of put it in verbs, which it, it sounds a little bit philosophical, but I, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I've never been someone to have like one year goals, five year goals and 10 year goals, because I found that um, life changes so much that even if you set yourself goals, they can just fall apart. Yeah. Or maybe you want to change tech or do something else entirely. Um, and then maybe you, you know, you start a family and that changes your priorities as well. That's right. So, and I also think in don't know if that's a satisfying answer. Though. Yeah, but also in freelancing, I think it's very difficult to set a three or five or ten year goal yeah. because you don't know. Maybe one of your one of your biggest clients goes bankrupt, and then you have to completely reshuffle your business model. And you know, so that's very difficult. But what I found that. I don't even know if I'm doing it consciously, but uh, Alex here has helped me a tremendous amount because oh. we've been, no, but you know, we've been doing a whole bunch of different projects. So yes. we, we're doing uh, training events in Germany. We're doing the podcast. So for example, coming here to London, that was one of the big goals of this year. That was one of the big things that we set out to do. Oh, yeah. And so now we're here. So as soon as we're done with the London thing, I'm pretty, <laughs> next? I'm pretty sure we're going to come up with the next lunatic idea that yeah. is going to take us to, I don't know where. Um, and those are kind of like these, these step, by step kind of goals and it's not a big end game but it kind of forms a nice cohesive interpreting persona yeah that made no sense but it sounded great no but i think what you probably mean is that as interpreters we are usually quite curious people and we're in interested in a lot of different things and that may lead to kind of side projects or maybe you know second jobs or whatever yeah i think that's just natural because um many interpreters that we know do things on the side that do not necessarily have anything to do with interpreting. So, and that's kind yeah, of I fun. Found that, I found that interpreters aren't complacent people. No, not at all. We're, we're busy bodies. Stay, stay hungry, stay yeah, foolish. Yeah, stay you hungry. Know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Could we also say that if you've got a specific goal, you may need be, you may not be so open minded to other opportunities around you because you're mm. so focused on one goal yeah. and you may be missing out on loads of Absolutely. opportunities. But I think it's a good thing too, because if you have something to work towards to it, yeah. it kind of helps you focus and, and, you know, figure out what you need to do to get there. So I'm not saying it's a bad thing to have a goal or something. It's just something that for me, wasn't was wasn't really a thing or maybe i just didn't realize it was no know. so i've had different goals you know throughout the career and i think those are kind of natural career progression steps so i wanted to become mm. part of the different um, interpreting associations so i wanted to be in the german association i wanted to be I, uh, a member of aik that was a huge step for me that was one of the big big goals that i had and i think those are kind of natural career progression steps that you can work on and kind of improve yourself with the respective trainings that they offer and so on and so forth so i think those are kind of natural goals that you can set yourself um and besides that just kind of figure out what interests you maybe you want to do maybe you're really interested in the automotive industry and then you eventually say hey i'm really knowledgeable in that maybe i can actually put on a workshop and then that can become a goal for you a personal goal for you that maybe nobody else has mm. that you want to be able to hold a workshop so um, i think it's really about finding Finding out what makes you happy and kind of your own personal goals. But yeah. I don't think there's a huge... Scratching the itches. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We always say that it's the journey to get there that's more interesting yeah. rather yeah, than the uh, exactly. end results. So it's a sense of direction. Could we say that rather than a goal, maybe it's a, a potential goal gives you a sense of direction? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's merit. As I said, there's, there's merits to both. I, I really admire people actually who have goals, clear-cut goals, and work towards them. But it just doesn't work for me, I think. So, yeah. I think the end goal is to all be quite comfortable in retirement and be able to live off the job. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good goal. I, I think what one goal would be to to do this for a long time and not 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 wanting to retire at, as early as possible because you're just so fed up with everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be nice. That would be very nice. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I think one goal is that when you get up in the morning, you know why you're getting up and yeah. you know what you're going to do and, and that brings you a lot of happiness and it, yeah. it helps you grow as a person. Yeah, I think so too, yeah. Absolutely. If it's just a drag, but you mentioned that earlier, then maybe it's time to... Maybe take it's time to look for, at something else. Yeah. Exactly. Like, exactly. Yeah. yeah, good. That was a nice that question is. to round it off. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's another question. Yeah. We're not run it off yet. <laughs> not yet. can't get to it easily. <laughs> <laughs> well, we already talked about some languages and like, you know, like, yeah. what would you suggest? And Mohammed asked about Arabic language. I was wondering about, you know, um, as being a person from the Slavic background, so Russian, Ukrainian, mm -hmm. I was wondering, like, you know, what would, what would you suggest? Should I learn French, 
Spanish, I mean, my Spanish is very, very passive. But how do you see the situation? Like, you know, is it better to work on the similar um, language family or is it better to go into something different, like from Slavic into Latin languages? Mm. You know, what would you say? Well, I think that experience? depends on your goals in life, right? <laughs> well, I know I mean, you say that, but like, you know, but, but how, just, how do you see in Europe? What is the situation in Europe? I mm. think just for practical purposes, I think it is easier if you learn sort of related languages. Um, so, for example, when I was at university, I had Russian and French, among others. And I then uh, later on started Romanian. And Romanian is is a, Rom is a, a Latin-based language, but it also has um, a lot of Slavic influences. So that was kind of a perfect fit. Um, but the reason I started Romanian wasn't that. The reason I started Romanian was because I got to know the country and a lot of people in Romania. And I was just so well, basically in love with everything that I really wanted. I had this motivation to start learning this language. And I think this would probably be the best the best starting point. I guess it's similar for yeah. you with Italian, yeah. that you start learning a language because you're passionate about it, or maybe it could be a love interest, you know? I mean, that's that's traditionally always a good reason <laughs> to learn a foreign language. Well, um, that's, that's English. It's not always so an option. Yeah, well. there you go. Yeah. Yeah. You worked so out. that's covered. Um, so I, I th because the, the, the thing with learning a language is, is it takes quite a bit of time. Yeah. It takes a lot of motivation and you want something that keeps you going. And um, what keeps you going is not necessarily that it's an easy to learn language because it's similar. What what keeps you going is usually the, the interest. Then you really want to you want to get into the language. You want to dive into the culture and you want to learn about learn more about that. So unle unless you you are in a, in a market that has very specific requirements, I probably just go with that sort of the motivational aspect. Yeah, just kind of do what you like. I mean, I guess you also kind of see it in in what sort of uh, inquiries you get. I mean, if you get fifty inquiries for Russian into uh, Portuguese, then maybe you could sort of look into learning Portuguese, but yeah, maybe there aren't that many people who do that. And maybe right. if, if you could provide that, that is then you can kind of look well. at that. But I think you can kind of, kind of gauge, I mean, you can be very technical about it and kind of go through your emails or your telephone records and kind of see this was an inquiry that I couldn't provide the right language combination for. And then you can kind of tally it up and see if it's worth the time and money investment. But I, I actually much prefer the kind of like the emotional angle. The love if you just yeah, not the, yeah, the love. Well, that's English. not in your case. That's I English know. for yeah, me. Yeah, I know. Um, but um, <laughs> I prefer that angle because even if in 2018 you might have gotten 50 inquiries for Russian into Portuguese, maybe next year you get none. And so that yeah. that purely economical angle could obviously be an incentive. Um, but I think if you know in your heart of hearts that this is a language that you like learning, that you would want to work with, and there's also some economic potential. I think that's a much that would be, ideal, that yeah. would be a much better uh, road to go down than just saying people want this. I cannot provide it because you can, you won't be able to provide Russian into Portuguese in 2018. So all these these yeah, inquiries that you've missed, exactly. you've already missed them, and there is no guarantee that you're going to have the same inquiries in the future. Um, so I think just find out what kind of what, what countries do you like, what cultures do you like, where do you have many friends, what are your interests. I think that's a better way to go, because at the end of the day, you're going to have to work with that language a ton and read about the country and read these books. And if it just turns out to be a, a drag, all the money in the worth is all the money in the world is really not worth it at the end of the day. But would you say that in Europe, French is more popular than Spanish, for example? Probably the other way around. I, I think we might get punched from the right hand side, depending <laughs> on what we say now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, if you just. The so, like the Russians like the sun, don't they? Don't they yeah. Yeah. Yes. They like to go to Switzerland, yeah. which is so more friends, maybe. Um, but, well, in, in terms of popularity in foreign language learning, I think Spanish is, has overtaken French at this point, mm. at least in the UK and probably Germany as well. Mm. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah. Before we close out, I just wanted to thank um, Danielle for uh, having us here today. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and I wanted to thank Hugo for uh, helping us make this happen as well with the logistics and everything. Um, and thank you for coming. Um, this is a Saturday, so we really appreciate you coming back, yeah. even on the weekend. <laughs> with such great, great yeah, questions and the questions it was really good. Great. Yeah, we really enjoyed sort of... Um, yeah, interrogating ourselves and sort of yeah. coming, coming up with things to say. So yeah, really we were sitting it. at the hotel yesterday, go, kind of going through the questions, and it was uh, yeah, we already had a lively discussion yesterday. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that, and uh, well, good luck with everything. Yeah. Thank you.
And, and if would, you ever have like anything, I'd like to thank you as well for being here on a Saturday at the weekend. You know, <laughs> well, we're here anyway. So I knew why I was getting up this morning. You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, so it was. We, we've been looking forward to having you here for quite a while now. Thank you so and, much. And uh, putting the questions together, I would like to thank students for their great uh, questions as well. That that's lovely. And I would like to maybe um, summarize. We're thinking about. Um, you know what we talked a lot. What we talked about a lot today is sharing, uh, togetherness, mm -hmm. uh, collaborating with colleagues, uh, being open-minded, uh, and I think that ties very nicely with the knowledge center that just yep. uh, went live. You know, two yep. days ago. So my question for you is: Will your podcast be visible on the knowledge center? Yeah, I was actually um, thinking about maybe uh, setting up a page with. Because there's, a, there's actually a lot of um, interpreting focus podcasts now, and ours is not the only one. So there are different podcasts covering different fields. So yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. you. And if you guys ever have any questions when we're already gone, feel free to email us or find us on Twitter or on our website through the blog. Just send us questions, send us inspirations, thoughts you have. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Inspirational quotes. Inspirational Maybe. quotes, memes, anything you, <laughs> yeah. you, you find. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.